test, test, test. So yeah, that looks like I'm good. Okay. I'm Phil Wyman, and this is the Wild Theology Podcast, where the world, the humans in it, and God are all wilder than we've been told. That's your intro. So, you'll get philosophy and theology and crazy stories that come from 30 years of pastoring, 20 years of festival work, and the uh, mud and blood of wrestling with the living in the spaces angels fear to tread. Ooh, trying to sound interesting, are we? Yeah, you think you got something to say? Yes. Yeah, that's the problem, Dimwit. Like I'm a lot smarter than you think. Yeah, you tied your shoes this morning. Whatever. We're, We're Phil Wyman, and this is Wild Theology, where you get to argue with your own ideas. And lose. That's the point. If you would like to support this podcast, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Phil Wyman. Things to tell you. Look at my cool shoes. Yeah. I wore out my other ones, so I had to get some new Skeletos. I think they're pretty awesome. It's like being barefooted. Okay, and this is take two on this podcast. Um, as I'm wandering around the park and in Long Beach, had to change out the phone and put on my uh, my Shure MV88 mic to try and get better sound because the wind was rustling past the little phone mic. And, um, so anyway, uh, as I'm playing around with my uh, Juin Smooth 4 and trying to get it to do the cool things like follow my face um, and testing out this whole process, I'm also going to do this rather rambling podcast today. Um, recent uh, podcasts that I've done about politics and a blog post in particular that I did about how I believe that the evangelical church has sold its soul for a Donald Trump presidency have made me think about something um, only remotely connected to politics, uh, more, more directly connected to my life as a whole and to my um, feeling about the gospel and truth. Um, I, it dawned on me to what degree people can't figure me out. Uh, when I talk about politics. I'm an equal opportunity offender when it comes to critiquing the right and the left, or um, at times praising the right and the left. I think the season we live in is so uh, divisive that there's more critique to be had than there is um, uh, praise to be made. And for me, praise will typically come when right and left sit down and talk to each other. That's, that's the place I'll um, find the most praise. But uh, I do discover that people just can't seem to figure me out. One moment, they figure I must have voted for Donald Trump because I critique uh, the left. And the next moment, they figure that I must have voted for Hillary Clinton because I um, am so critical of Donald Trump. But uh, neither one of those is the fact. And the fact that I voted third party, um, they, they, people will tell me, well, I'm the reason Trump got into office. And, you know, I reject that, first of all, because I was in Massachusetts and it's not like my vote meant anything. That was a blue all the way state. But uh, apart from that, um, I really find myself in a place of being misunderstood. And quite frankly, I'm really happy with that. The same thing happens to me in respect to my Christianity and my positions um, on theological issues. People one moment assume that I'm very progressive and the next moment they assume that I'm extremely conservative. And I suppose in some sense both could be true. I I may be, as I've jokingly said about politics, right of right and left of left. Um, So you're not going to find me caught in the middle because my positions won't land there either. And uh, as an example, um, for a number of years I was uh, uh, part of the Wild Goose Festival, helping create some of the uh, events that occurred at it. I was... I, I, I was the, the I was the guy who created the secret events that were off the uh, schedule, 
Um, the morning dip in the water, uh, the Celtic prayer, which um, is still going on, I believe. Uh, and and so I was, uh, we'd go stand in the river and pray and at seven in the morning and then the midnight moonshine mass and cigar whiskey and philosophy it was assumed because i did crazy events like midnight moonshine mass that it was probably the most progressive individual there at the wild goose festival at least some people thought that um, others who knew me understood that my theology is really very conservative and i don't quite fit <coughs> excuse me into the um what's the remainder of the um, emergent movement i i don't quite fit into that uh, because i'm one of those missional guys from the early emergent movement um, and that's where my concern lies so if you couldn't figure me out because i seemed at one moment that i was progressive and then the next moment conservative both politically and theologically it's because um i really think that's where Jesus was too. He was misunderstood, right? Pharisees were trying to figure him out and couldn't do it. And so, being uh, difficult to figure out, I think, is something that actually comes because of a position I do hold. I'm not about any particular denomination, and I'm not about any particular party. I'm not about any particular business, and I'm not about any particular local church. I'm not about any particular nation when it comes down to it in the end. What I am about is people. And so if a position is good for people, then I'm for that position. And if a position is bad for people, then I'm against that position. Um, that is a fairly simple sounding thing, but the complexity of it lies in the fact that our world is so wildly weird. And it's filled with the challenges of um, individuals who say one thing and do another, mixed motivations and struggles for power and greed. These kind of things stand in the way of any kind of real change for the better. And perhaps in this sense, I'm... Uh, quite easy to figure out, but in another sense, um, you'll never nail me down to the typical boxes. Uh, you won't be able to tick off all the little demographic points that I fit into. Um, I'm happy with that, and I think as Christians we ought to be that way. Um, for the wind blows where it will, and we don't know where it's coming from or where it's going to so is everyone who's born of the spirit John chapter 3 we should be enigmatic and mysterious just as Jesus was and in a very real sense so is the gospel who accepts all people in spite of their positions and loves all people in spite of their activities so, um, if I'm hard to figure out, I like it that way. That's my rambling point number one for this podcast. So, uh, my second point of concern for this podcast is I'm uh, just going to talk a little bit about why I wrote um, a recent blog post that was entitled... Um, well, what was the title? The Evangelical Church, How the Evangelical Church Sold Its Soul for Trump Presidency? Um, something like that. Anyway, um, it's, it's rather an important uh, blog post, I believe, in terms of defining how I feel about uh, the position of the Evangelical Church today. and. When I say evangelical, I, I'll give a definition in just a moment, but uh, um, I believe that it is potentially losing its witness in um, what could be a permanent fashion. It certainly is has long-term ramifications, but maybe it has permanent ramifications for the overall 
witness and reputation of the evangelical church. Now when I say evangelical, I have rather a broad definition for those of you who are um, hard line uh, Calvinist evangelicals. Um, you have a rather narrow definition that includes those who are Calvinist and typically not Pentecostal. Um, evangelical Church in its initiation was a much broader movement that included Pentecostals and in fact uh, the Pentecostals made up a large portion of those who were considered Pentecostal. So my definition would fit under that. Pentecostals, Charismatics, um, to uh, conservative Baptists, um, those who uh, would consider uh, the salvation of the individual to be of uh, foremost interest to God and at the heart of the gospel itself, um, who believe that it's by faith that we are saved and that the work of Christ uh, on the cross was one of um, bringing about a forgiveness for our sins for those who have faith in him. Um, Bible believing uh, typically in a conservative manner, um, kind of a what you see is what you get in a Bible reading, not in a fundamentalist sense, but uh, in in a, in a simple, I believe it's God word, God's word kind of way. This typically is um, an evangelical approach to scriptures. And so it's to those evangelicals that I want to uh, give this little reasoning for why I wrote an article called How the Evangelical Church Sold Its Soul for a Trump Presidency. Um, I believe we're at some um, kind of crossroads at the moment, and a lot of people have been saying this for a long time, that the evangelical church is losing its reputation and its ability to reach people in our world because of um, not just its political positions, but uh, that, that, that's a major component of it. The Trump presidency has brought this to the forefront because it seems that we're willing to overlook his um, unethical behavior, his sometimes outright lying. Now, whether you believe he's lying or he's unethical, that's another thing altogether, but certainly a good percentage of the population of our world, and particularly those who are in need of discovering the love of God most, feel that way that uh, Trump is unethical and greedy and power-hungry and, um, and dangerous. And so by marrying ourselves to his presidency, which ha happened to the tune of eight out of every ten uh, evangelicals. Um, now the definition of the evangelicals voted for Trump was fairly narrow in itself because it uh, defined primarily white evangelicals in America as opposed to a broader perspective of including black Pentecostal churches and black Baptist churches that would fit into a Pentecostal theology in terms of uh, their desire to see people experience the love of God. Um, so that definition in and of itself is even a, a, a little questionable. But um, the fact of the matter is that by marrying ourselves to a man whose morals do not match that of the church and whose um, ethics both personally and in his government behavior, uh, his political behavior, uh, we appear to be hypocrites who say one thing and do another. We want to talk about desiring uh, God's best uh, for our nation and uh, seeing God work among our people, but to get a few votes for whatever position we hold dearest, whether it's um, some position of uh, a trade and um, economics or it has to do with abortion um, or prayer in schools. In, in some sense, we're 
he's tossing us a bone. Could it be that he's tossing us a bone in we're trading it for our reputation? To me, it seems that way. And so I think we set a dangerous precedent where uh, as leaders, we tell people that this is God's will and this is God's man. And then he lives and behaves like he does. Um, I don't know about you, but that seems to be an earmark of hypocrisy. And I think other people are reading it that way. This is why it, I wrote a blog post about it and sent it to as many people as I could get it to uh, so that uh, I might highlight the danger we live in at this moment. And it's not that I believe that the work of God hinges upon the, um, the success or the ethics of the evangelical church. The evangelical church can fall away into some distant and uh, broken point of history and, and live out the rest of its days as something that is just a has-been. And, and that wouldn't hinder the work of God. But it's a movement that I've been a part of ever since I became a Christian. And so I'm a little reluctant to see it go without speaking to it. And the moment we live in now is a prophetic moment. It's a moment when we need to um, see the writing that's on the wall and uh, adjust accordingly. So uh, my feelings about this issue have been written down in black and white. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of... Uh, reasoning for why I did that. You probably hear some squawking of birds right now and I, I don't, I doubt I can get a picture of it but uh, there's, uh, they're, they're just flying wildly all around me. There's a a, uh, a a fairly large flock, I guess is the word, of parrots that are wild here in Long Beach and they make a squawking noise these big uh, green parrots with a bit of red on them. They're absolutely beautiful. And uh, anyway, that's what was all that squawking just was. So anyway, those are a couple of my thoughts today for the Wild Theology Podcast. Um, perhaps you got a little bit of sense of why I call it Wild Theology um, in that first little segment where I talked about being hard to pin down. See, I think uh, God, the world, and even ourselves, we're uh, wilder than most theological positions have told us um, that we are. And so it's not, not an easy thing to pin down any of those factors. So yeah, this is the Wild Theology Podcast. Um, you can find it on Patreon, patreon.com slash philwyman. And you can also find my YouTube channel, which is Phil Wyman on YouTube, and please uh, uh, follow that, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and uh, you can follow me on uh, Facebook and or Twitter, and uh, you can find me on Patreon, and if you'd like to uh, be a supporter of these podcasts, you can do so at patreon.com slash philwyman. Thanks. This is the way to finish the Wild Theology Podcast. Thank you to my patrons who help make these missional travels and these podcasts possible. Without you, I couldn't do it. God bless. If you'd like to support this project, you can do so here on Patreon for as little as $1 a release. And at the most, that's $4 a month. Why on earth would anybody want to support us? But I think we're pretty cool, and maybe some people believe in what we're doing. Oh, come on, you really that? Mm, yeah. 
Don't you ever think they're just a little too weird for the average person? Um, yeah, sometimes. <laughs>